we're all generating lots of data in the things that we do. So uh, it might be sort of what you think of as explicitly data you generate when you go and put something on Facebook or you tweet something or you have an email or whatever. Um, but even activities like driving or shopping now generate quite a lot of data around them. There's a notion of a data, digital footprint, for example, um, where that's sort of captured. And the, we, we sort of had this model, uh, we thought a bit about how, how the world's kind of developing this way. And so we came up with this notion of something we call human data interaction. So there's a field in computer science called human computer interaction, where people have been studying for a good 50 years now. What's happening now is it's less about interacting with the machine specifically, as it is about interacting with data. Data is generated about you, data is generated by you, and this data is used in the environment by computational devices to do things on your behalf or do things to you, um, provide you with credit scoring or uh, things like this. The model we sort of drew for this was the idea that you've got people and they generate data, and that data feeds into analytics algorithms, and those analytics algorithms generate actions. Something happens in the world as a result. You get a particular credit score or you get your mortgage or you don't get your mortgage or whatever it might be. Your insurance premium changes or something. And those actions change your behavior, perhaps, or might involve more data, inferences from the data being put back into the data set, which are then used subsequently to do more analytics and so on. So you've got the opportunity for feedback loops in this. So the behavior you have generates things that change your behavior and so on. The belief we have about this is the way that this is evolving, the way this is coming about, uh, is missing various features that are necessary. And there were three in particular that we defined, uh, legibility, agency, and what we call negotiability. And so the notion with these was that legibility is the ability to see and understand what's going on. Well, the observation is that for a lot of people, it's very difficult to understand all the different sources of data that are being collected about you. Um, and it's difficult, if you do understand them, to see what that data means and what the implications of somebody having collected that data might be. Agency then is the capacity to act. So if you do see what's going on, you do have some understanding what's going on, very often you can't actually do very much about it. Um, so you can't go in and correct incorrect data that's been collected about you and say, no, that's a mistake, it's not, not, not what I think. Or uh, if somebody's drawn an inference about you because they've looked at your spending pattern and they've looked at your um, demographic and they've looked at your tweets and they've decided that you are definitely a Tory voter um, and you want to go in and say, no, no, actually I'm not, right? I, I, you know, I'm an independent or I vote liberal or whatever it might be. Um, and people are doing that sort of analysis to form those kinds of inferences, but quite often it's difficult for you to go in and change them and correct them if the inference is incorrect. And a lot of these inferencing algorithms, while they're quite good and they might be getting 80, 85% accuracy, that still leaves 15, 20% wrong data that's coming out of them. That's agency, so the capacity to act. Negotiability then is the idea that actually these systems are dynamic. So a lot of the time when you sign up to services, for example, you check the box, you don't read the terms and conditions, just say, yeah, yeah, I want to do it now. Right, give me my Gmail account or let me have Facebook or something. And you don't have the ability to go back once you've understood a bit more about what's happening and change that. You tend to be either you said yes or you said no. Very often it's you've said yes and that's it for all time. Uh, increasingly now, some companies are getting better at giving you a chance to pull back out again, but it tends to be this complete withdrawal. I can take all my Google data out of Google and I can leave. But that's still quite a binary kind of you either get it or you don't get it. You don't get so much choice over what you can pick and choose and how you deal with that. What I always um, think of this is when you go on Amazon and at some point you bought some niece a birthday present and then you get all the recommendations for yeah. things are based around that. At least in Amazon you suppose you've got the chance to say don't use this. But yeah, that, that's a very simplistic part of data, is it? In the Amazon example, I don't know if Amazon do this, but it may well be the case that some companies on the web, for example, will share that data with other companies. And so even if you do go and correct it at source, that correction doesn't get followed through to all the other companies that have then picked up that data set previously to you going and correcting it. Um, so you have this sort of bad data about you is kind of spreading around the place. Um, so, so we felt that a lot of the way that these systems are currently constructed don't pay attention to some of these, these features. There may be other things that are missing. People may disagree about how serious some of these things are, but we felt that these things were certainly missing and it was a problem. So we were sort of thinking about what could we do in terms of building technology to try and create a platform on which these things could be addressed. The observation then was that, well, a lot of the way these systems work is you take data from people and you feed the data uh, into some, some organization, it's supposed to be a factory, some organization's machines, right? So data goes up into the cloud. Art was not my subject, um, as you can tell. So data gets fed into the cloud somewhere, gets taken away, gets computed upon, inferences are drawn, and so the whole thing the whole thing carries on. I could be the problem with this is what happens here. So once you've taken the data away from the person, you lose quite a lot 
about it. So you lose lots of metadata and context about it. So you don't know where that data came from. You don't know that the purchase was for your niece anymore. You just know that the purchase was made. You've also created quite a technical problem, which is that you've now got millions and millions of users where you're trying to get data from all of them and keep that and store that and manage and manipulate that. And that could be quite expensive to do. It could be quite difficult to do depending on the size of the company involved. Um, you know, so companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft have got the expertise to manage that and they do and they do that really well. Um, but for companies that are sort of a bit smaller than that or don't have that sort of technical background, it's, a, it's potentially a difficult thing to deal with. Potentially you've created a honeypot effect here. So it's now the case that if you attack that company as an attacker and you get hold of the data, you might get millions of people's data at the same time. So there's quite a value in being able to get hold of that. So there's a sort of an attractiveness to making that an attack target. Um, and so this, the, this sort of the, the observation is that this all sort of starts from the idea that you're taking data away from people. Um, and you're taking it somewhere else to do something with it. So what we proposed in this project called Databox was that wouldn't it be good if we could uh, provide some technical means that would allow people to keep their data, keep control of their data, and uh, sort of manage access to that data. So we'd still try and provide all the same facility in terms of the analytics that might be carried out, but we try and do so in a way that means that people, the people, the data subjects, to use the technical terminology, the data subjects are going to be um, more able to see what's happening, more able to control what's happening, and more able to, to make decisions about what should happen and shouldn't happen on a kind of case-by-case uh, -case basis, rather than having this sort of blanket, yes, I accept all the terms, this is fine. Um, there are other sort of benefits as well, you have legal benefits, for example. So there's recent legislation from the European Union that's, that's coming in, and I think is due to come in before Brexit happens, uh, however that's going to happen. Um, and that's going to cause, that causes, for example, uh, data protection to be m even more stringent than it already is, um, and the fines in place to be even more uh, heavyweight than they already are. So I'm not a legal expert, but as I understand it, there, there was legislation in the States from Obama, so there's a Consumer Protection, Consumer Privacy Act, I think, um, although I believe that Trump either has or wishes to uh, kick that out again. I don't know where that's going to end up. Um, I think there's similar similar views held in Japan as well. There's also legislation in Japan. So this is not just a European thing. There's, there, is, there is certainly concern about this or growing awareness of this in, in a number of places in the world. Um, so you've got this, um, and as part of that legislation, there's a, there's a lot in there about um, trying to design for privacy, trying not to collect data you don't need to collect, trying to make sure that the data subject is aware of the purpose for which the collection is happening and the purpose for which the process is happening and what's going to come out of it and so on. So it's supposed to make it all a bit more transparent, and so, which is, I think, in the end, a good thing because it, it's good that people, it would be good if people could effectively trust what was going on and understand what was happening, right? So the idea was, what can we do technically to try and assist people with that? So the notion with the data box is the idea that we should explore the possibility that instead of the data flowing out and then being taken away and stuff happening with it, keep the data locally. And then if the company wishes to, my fake factory again, not that we have factories anymore, there we go. If the company wishes to process this data, what it might do, for example, is it could send some piece of computation, some app, and distribute that app to different people's data boxes. Can't even draw stick men. That app could then compute across that data work out some answer, and then that single answer gets sent back. So we don't need to know your shopping history, we just need to know whether you are um, a big spender, medium spender, or a tight one. Right? That's, maybe that's all we care about. Right? Um, and so I don't need to look at all the, all the information there. I don't need to, sorry, I don't need to, I need to look at all the information, but I don't need to hold all the information. Um, I don't, and I, in fact, I may not want a copy of all that information because that has, now has certain obligations on me as somebody holding data about you that I have to I'm obligated to do things for you now, um, provide you with information about what I'm doing with it, store it appropriately, keep it safe, secure, all this kind of stuff. Um, so it may in fact be better for me not to have to do that and not to take on that risk and that responsibility. I'm looking at your diagram there and I'm thinking this looks a little bit like kind of what we do with mobile phones anyway at the minute. Don't we kind of put our details into a phone and then say yes or no to apps doing things with that data? That sort of permissions model is, is, not, is kind of similar, yes. Um, there, I mean, there are a lot of problems with that permissions model as well, such as you might not understand what the permissions really mean, or you, again, you don't have a chance to choose about the permissions. It's like the app demands these permissions, and you either get them or you don't, you grant it or you don't. Although there are, there are actually things you can do with some of the phones, so for example, Android phones, um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's a library you can install if you root your phone, which you can then have an app that provides you with control over the permissions being granted on the phone. So it's specifically, you can get quite 
so detailed about this. So it presumably sits in between the app and the actual data. Yeah, so I mean, built into standard Android now, there's the ability to control permissions being granted. So you can you can take away permissions from apps, and they may not work if you do that, but you can take them away. And so you've got this quite granular permission, quite granular control over it. And the idea here is sort of similar in the sense that we'd like to be able to, to enable people to exercise that sort of level of control. Um, there's a few things to say about this, though. One is that um, I'm not saying that everybody should have to exercise that level of control all the time for all the possible uses of all their data, because that would be completely infeasible and such a pain. Um, but you should have the ability to do that if you want. Um, and it may well be that we can build tools that use that ability to try and represent what you want to do or give you default behaviors that make sense or at least alert you when things have gone wrong because of releases that have happened. But there's, there's a sort of there's a need for that kind of infrastructure to be made available, I think. Um, also, it's not just about stopping things happening. So it's not just the case that I want to stop data going into the cloud. I might want to, um, it might be beneficial to me that if you try and analyze my shopping habits, you don't do from the point you don't do it from the point of view of a single shop. Um, so one of the examples I had for this was when I used to live in Cambridge, I'd shop at Tesco's and at Sainsbury's. I'd shop at Tesco's to buy the cleaning products and the fruit and veg because they were quite cheap. I didn't think very much of the quality of the meat and fish counter at the particular Tesco's I went to. Um, so I tended to get that stuff from Sainsbury's where I thought it was better. But if you analyze those data sets, then Sainsbury's might view me as a filthy uh, carnivore, while Tesco's view me as a fastidiously clean vegan. And neither of these things are true. Right? I'm, I'm neither one nor the other there. I'm a mixture of those things. Um, and so the idea here would be that you can actually get benefits from this from both the consumer and the data processor point of view, the data subject and the data processor point of view, because you get a more, you possibly get access to a more complete picture of the individual in question, because you can access more of their data because you're accessing it for a specific purpose and you're not just trying to collect as much of it as you can in all these cases. It's to give you more say in the matter so that you're not, you're not the, just the product, right? You are actually an individual in this and you, you have some, some say in what's, what's being done. Um, again, I mean, it's not, it's not as simple as saying that you just get everything and it's all yours, for example. So one of the other, another challenge in this is that the way I've presented this, the way we've talked about it and the way a lot of people think about it is the idea that you've got personal data and you own your personal data and it's yours and it's about you. And actually, when you stop and think about it, an awful lot of personal data involves at least one other person. Right, so um, you know, if you look at, I don't know, Internet of Things data, sensing in the home, smart homes and things like this, that's everybody in the household is in some sense represented in that. It's not just you, unless you really do live alone and never have any visitors, um, which maybe some people do, but, but not in most cases. Um, even email, email's usually got a sender and a receiver, right? So there's at least two people that might have a claim on the content of that email. Um, and so this, the, the notion of ownership is a bit tricky and the notion of personal data being solely owned by a single individual is a bit tricky. Um, and so then you end up with, with playing games like, well, how do, you, how do you deal with that when you might have two or three people who want to say yes to something and another person who's represented the data who wants to say no to it and kind of what, what happens there. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a sort of challenging, there are challenges in this, but it, seem, it still seems like this kind of construction where at least we're letting the data subjects have some say in these matters and have some ability to act. I'm just thinking about that email thing. I mean, usually for me, it's, uh, t it's the same person sending and receiving. It's me sending myself an email <laughs> to remind myself uh, to do something that I'm going to forget.